Okay, so you can see the name of the presentation. This is about how to talk to vendors. So before we start, how many people have proper jobs and how many people work for vendors? <laughs> none, of, none of the above. None of the above. Well, you just make shit up, Howard. We know that. That's right. <laughs> so, who am I? Look, Martin Glassborough, that's what it says on the agenda, so hopefully that's who you're expecting. I write a bit, I blog a bit, commentate, all around know it all, better known as storage board. Stuff appears on the register on occasion. I've just had a bit of hiatus, I'm coming back again to start doing some more writing. Know it all, I still remember a couple of years ago, my daughter looking very upset when she said, Dad, you don't know it all, do you? She was a bit upset about that. I was even more upset. I do have a day job. I manage a team, which, is, which says there, uh, I manage a team which manages a lot of storage. Um, probably up to 60 petabytes now. Um, growing two to three petabytes a month at the moment, data put away. So. And by night, I annoy vendors. Well, mostly. And by day. Oh, no, I'm nice to them by day. I don't annoy them, I upset them. It's a difference. So why on earth should you listen to me about how to talk to a vendor? Well, I've been doing this for, uh, it says 10 years, it's probably much longer than that these days. I've spent many hours, wasted many hours in meetings with vendors, writing papers, issuing papers, and I've spent millions of dollars on this stuff. So I'm kind of used to it, but I also have a secret. Before I did started buying it, I used to sell it. So I've also done both sides of the fence. So I know how to talk to vendors, because I was one. I worked pre-sales, I wasn't a salesman. I make a big difference between sales and pre-sales. You really can come back from the dark side. You can. I've actually, I started on the light side, went to the dark side and came back again. And every now and then somebody tries to offer me enough money to go back on the dark side. Depends who's either upset that month. So. If anybody saw my presentation from last time, you'll still be expecting a slide like this. <laughs> Lies. Now, there you go. How do you tell when your vendor sales is lying? <laughs> yeah, noise is coming from the mouth. But I think that's, a, that's, that's probably a bit unfair. It's, it, it, it's kind of unfair because most of them are just telling lies because somebody else has told them to tell the lies. So, more lies. <coughs> How do you tell when your vendor marketeer is lying? Because he's the person who's been lying to his salesman all along to tell you his lies. You can't, even when they're asleep. They're still <laughs> dreaming of the lies they're gonna tell you on a PowerPoint. PowerPoint, I will get onto that later. But yet more lies. There you go, they're a very confused looking Pinocchio, what's happened here. Well, how do you tell when, when I'm lying, when the customer is lying? No chance. We're just confused. We don't even know we're lying when we're lying. <laughs> so. so how do we have a sensible conversation? Well, first of all, even if you're king, you're probably still lying. How do we get to truth? I wish I had a meeting room like that. <laughs> that would be very handy, but I don't. I'm sure Rupert has one somewhere. We don't talk about Rupert. <laughs> so, yeah, very much. It's taken years of practice to start to get uh, vendors to start telling the truth about me. Learning to ask good questions. You ask a right question, you'll sometimes get a good answer. Bad questions, bad answers. It's quite obvious. So what questions? How, sh how should you go about this? You get that call. We've all been to something like this, or a VM world, or a, and you get called from a vendor. Vendor X wants to come and talk to you. Your heart sinks. But eventually you give in and you let them come in. Well, here's some, here's some tips. Learn to set the agenda. 
don't let it become death by PowerPoint. The number of times you'll get a vendor coming in and he's turned up and he's got his PowerPoint already written. But it's the same PowerPoint he's given to a hundred other people at least. Also, when you're dealing with the big three-letter companies or two-letter companies, just don't let it become some horrible variation of a shopping channel. I've seen this where they turn up and they're going to tell you everything about their product set. There's hundreds of them. The HPs of this world, the EMCs of this world, they've got a product for every month, every day, every minute. <laughs> and eventually, you're just going to think, I'll just go away, I'll buy something. Where you just don't, don't let you get into that situation. So, prepare your brief. I've found this now, it's much easier if I say, OK, you can come and see me, but before you do, I'm going to send you an email and I'm going to tell you what I want to talk about. Not what you want to come and talk to me about, because I've had it with th these guys. They still do it, they still will come and talk to you about what they want to talk about, but at least you could, you've got that right at that time to throw them out of the room. And if you realistically, if you think about the average meeting, as a meeting I get with a vendor or a vendor gets time, I will give them an hour. I work on a large campus, actually, so I'm going to lose the first five to ten minutes of that, actually, as I'm walking across the campus. Then there'll be five to ten minutes of um, introductions. Then there'll be five minutes of scene setting. So they're going to get 30 minutes. And what actually happens at that point is you've got 30 minutes and they've got 120 slides to get through. <laughs> it's, it's, no, it's, it's not valuable for anybody. So focus on your problem. Tell them what they can do for you, but why you what need this to be fixed. It's, I often tell vendors, don't kind of and sell me that. I've got five solutions for that. I'm actually quite interested in that. Come and talk to me about that one thing which I haven't got at the moment. I may have already got a portfolio. I've got a gap. Come and talk to me about that gap. And so, so for vendors, that's a piece of advice, but you as an end user, get them to focus on your gaps. Really. Just forget about what you know. Don't come in. Don't start conversations, well, current vendor does it like this. Because inevitably, they'll start on a comparison shop and they'll start saying, well, we do it like that, because this way's better or their way's shit. That's what way happens. But I tell you what, we do like a bit of the gossip. We do like you to actually at times have a bit of a dig, it's quite good fun. But often, as a, from a, vendor, a piece of advice to vendors, often remember the customer you're talking to knows his current product much better than you ever will and probably knows what your product does. They already hopefully would have done a bit of research and they already know some of the weaknesses. <coughs> Nigel. Martin, do you ever find that um, competitive analysis from a vendor about another no, no, it's never valuable for one reason. All the competitive analysis is always done against the last generation of a piece of kit. And the number of times I have a vendor come in and they'll present a roadmap thinking it's the sexiest, best roadmap in the world. I really hate to tell them that I've had that same roadmap presentation from three or four other people. It happens all the time. Everybody's roadmap is pretty much the same. And what we're going to do next is always better than what they did last. Yeah. So there's the classic um, NetApp Clarion benchmark test where they actually compared it not against a current Clarion and they persisted on those figures so much it started to lose credibility with people who really knew the market. So, well, if you're going to compare your new stuff against their generation minus two, if you can't win, you're doing something wrong. But hey, technology is going to save us all. But Really, it's, this is very, often, very rarely the case. Very rarely do these conversations become technology questions. So I say, talk about what you're trying to achieve. Don't ask, do you support snapshots? That's a silly question, because they'll all say yes. Ask what tools instant data recovery, because some people might, some people might have something different. And also, as soon as you get into a snapshot, snapshot conversation, you get up in, the, you eventually, certainly in the years gone by, you end up in that uh, conversation. NetApp's 
used to believe if you understood their snapshot, it was a guaranteed sale. If you're selling a, something on a single feature. Also, when you're issuing RFPs, ITTs, whatever, don't use vendor-specific terminology. <coughs> because actually, what you find is if you really are want to go into competitive um, ITT or RFP, is the vendor, and you've got already got an incumbent, vendors start to get a bit suspicious, and they almost feel that it's been written just to qualify what you already believe. Well, so too many customers let the sales guy write the RFP. Yeah, absolutely, Howard. So don't let that happen. <coughs> so don't talk about replication. Ask how you might implement DR using their systems, because replication may not be the appropriate way of doing it. They may turn around and say, actually, don't use our replication. Use DataGuard. It's a better way of doing things. And I tell you what, almost nobody needs synchronous replication. <laughs> it's funny how often it comes up as a requirement on the dark side. I know it does. Yeah. All the time. All the time. Yeah. Nobody needs it. Mm. Well, why not? Well, there are better ways of doing replication outside of the array. Synchronous replication gives you crash consistent copies. That's actually not very useful. <laughs> In many situations, if you've got an SR, if you've got simple synchronous replication for an Oracle database, it's crash consistent. Doesn't necessarily mean your database is going to come up cleanly. It's still going to have to check itself up. You would be better, for instance, if you've got a recovery point or an RTO which is close to zero, running DataGuard because you know you have a consistent working database. Crash consistent is like the worst oxymoron. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yes, but that's what that's, that's what's incorrect gear is. Basically, you've turned a computer off. Yeah. Your application could still be up the swanee. It doesn't help you in today's world where we're heading towards a more active, active situation, but it just doesn't help. Think of different ways of doing it. That's why things like the, um, the NoSQL databases do it with their own internal replication. I, I, I would advise everybody to be, certainly from a database, which is where it's often mo most commonly used, Look at doing it in the application. Look at doing something somewhere else. Yep. Another thing which is kind of useful, if you start asking really difficult questions, you might find that the sales guy, A, doesn't know what he's talking about, and B, he's going to have to go away and bring somebody else in who might know what they're talking about. Which is OK if he acknowledges that. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a good qualification as well, Hans. If he's still willing to plow on, you think, you're not the right person. I don't want to buy your stuff. Right. Ask them, as yet again, this comes back to driving a conversation. Ask them to solve your problem. Describe the problem. But in business terms, don't use technology terms, just really get into practice. Then ask, how does it solve the problem? But not the problem they think you've got or they want, to, want you to have. To, it just ha happens far too often, and we get brochureware. And you, you can walk into enterprise shops all over the place, and there'll be rows of shelfware which they've bought to solve a problem which they didn't actually have or wasn't that important because they've not implemented it. Make them do their homework. As I say, I brief before. Often I try and use these meetings now. If I'm really serious about them, I'll spend an hour talking to them, and I'll expect them to come in two or three weeks later with something with a work proposal. Uh, they, they shouldn't just be expecting to turn up and take some money. Revenge. I, I, would, <laughs> I would just add, when you're describing your problem, try as hard as you can to describe the problem and avoid solutions. Yeah, absolutely. There, too often customers jump over the problem to solutions. Like, I need synchronous replication. No, I need an RPO of 20 seconds. Mm. And yeah. once you get into solutions, they will follow you, even yeah. if they have a better solution. Yeah. Prepare to do something like this. Be prepared to PowerPoint them. Have your own PowerPoints. <laughs> yeah. What's good for the goose? Yeah. 
Site tours. Site tours are great. How many times have you done an executive briefing at a, something like EMC or NetApp or IBM or whoever, and they want to take you around plant? Once you've seen one plant, you've seen them all, but they still insist on doing it. So drag them around your site. And actually, it might be quite useful for them. And certainly, if you're doing something a bit different, they might get an idea about what type of company they're dealing with. And point out the competitor's kit on your floor. Oh, yeah, walking around a data centre, that's great fun. And saying, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been in data centres where you've got every vendor next to each other. <laughs> and you point out, one, there's, there's is the one turned off because it never worked properly. <laughs> As a customer, you have a job to do, and that is to also to sell to them. Really make them feel that they are really lucky to spend time with you. Make them get excited and go and do some work. Okay, now I'm going to get on to the horrible stuff. <laughs> Costs. Now, this is just a PC, but we've all been there. You've bought something, and it comes up with some, well, actually, what you really need, this, 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 and this. So how much? Be brutal. Tell them what you've got. Half it, probably. Don't ne never tell them exactly how much they've got. But also be a bit realistic. I, sometimes I've sat in meetings and I've sat there with finance people thinking, look, you can't have that. You can't have your flash for cents at the moment. It's not going to happen but people still want it, so be a bit realistic with them. But also make the vendor be realistic as well. Make them understand what they're selling you. Sometimes they have no idea, and sometimes they'll come away, and you'll know what their internal price lists are, are like. And sometimes they'll be promising anything to get to the next stage. If you're sitting there and their opening shot, you realise it's 90 points off the list, you're thinking that that's never going to fly. You're not going to get that through your internal processes. I'll tell you what, that's one thing finance and procurement really hate, a price going up. And then you start getting into the world of flash and other things where people are talking about compression and deduplication. They're talking about, OK, our, co our cost is the equivalent of spinning rotational disk. And you're like, OK, but you're making a, they're making an awful lot of assumptions about compression and dedupe at this point. If they're really that confident, make them guarantee and look at what they're guaranteeing and what file types they're guaranteeing. And that brings you on to lunch. Proof of outrageous claims. Just ask them for it. Can they prove what they're talking about? Oh, and Enrico, you talk about software-defined storage. There's a lot of people out there trying to convince you that buying software only is cheaper. I think as you start to dig in, you're going to find that's not quite the case unless you're a Google, unless you're on an Amazon, where you're doing your own kit manufacturer, your ODM, and you're doing it all yourself, and you've got really smart people doing this for you, as soon as you start factoring your maintenance costs, the installation costs, the integration costs, the costs of change, your own internal certification costs, these things can suddenly rack up. POCs are one of those things which, in today's world, very few customers really have enough time to run a realistic POC. But I could talk about more about how we get to proof of outrageous ca claims. And they don't even think about doing three at the same time. Yeah. If you really want to do a POC, you, you actually should do three. No one has time for that. Yeah. And actually, well, if you start running real business loads on a POC, you've then got to get off it again. It's a bat. Yeah, but, but that's a bake off. I mean, if you're just trying to prove a claim. Yeah. It is, it is a big yeah. Case studies. I'll start rattling through these a bit. Case studies. I don't know why, but I know why vendors issue them. They're a waste of time. <laughs> they really are. Because I, to, to, have, to have agreed to do a case study somewhere along the line, there has been a sweetener. There has been something extra two points of discount, extra piece of kit. Something along that line has happened. We're bringing it to our world of yeah. how you speak. Yeah. Cost savings case studies, they're bunk, really are. The number of times I say, well, we ripped out vendor X and we put vendor Y in and it saved us millions. 
Most of the time, you could have ripped out Vendorex's kit, which you've got there, replaced it with Vendorex's kit with new stuff, and actually made the same cost savings. Rip and replace is almost never a technical discussion. Rip and replace means that somebody has upset somebody somewhere along the line. <laughs> it's, a, it's an emotional thing. Yeah, that's the same. Most change the vendor driven by something different, it's not technology. So how do you start making, get, getting to the proof of outrageous claims? Make reference calls. I love doing reference calls. I've done lots of reference calls. I've had reference calls go horribly wrong for the vendor who's asked me to do the reference. Where, because they know, they, they know I'll be honest, but if, some, if somebody says, well, if you were doing this, what would you do? Well, I so said, I've got both pieces of technology on the, uh, on the floor, and for what you're trying to do, use that one. And they have gone and bought that one. It's quite a famous case where that's happened to somebody. So some people just won't ask me to do it. You so always ask to talk to other users. Ask to talk to users who've had problems. How did that vendor deal with them? You get to understand how their support works. Yeah, because the first reference, the first guy they give you to call is already <coughs> drank a lot of Kool-Aid. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and, and yeah, if, if you get to talk to them and say, well, it went horribly wrong, but they did this, this, and this for me, and it's fixed, you might feel they're actually a bit better. And try and do it without the sales, the, the, the sales guys on the call. Because sometimes you, the, the person who's a referee may want to say some really awkward things, things which they're not going to hear, and make sure it is a one-to-one -one confidential discussion. Strict NDAs in place, none of this gets back to the vendor. So, I also like to throw awkward questions at vendors. These are, these are some of my favourite. So this is test some honesty. <coughs> Asking about who their main competitors are. You may say that will drive them to gossip and bitch. I want to see whether they can tell me why the vendor is, the competitor is good. What the use cases are without trashing their technology. Tell me why you're better, don't tell me why they're rubbish. Brings you back to this conversation we've, we, we were talking about just a few minutes ago. Us, if you're dealing with flash vendors, ask them what the raw capacity cost is, because that is your worst case. So you need to know what your worst case is. So when certain startups come along a line and say, oh, we can give you this, this, and this. So okay, so what happens if I put uncompressible data on this. I do it all the time, but it's my job. Yeah. Now this is sort of left with, this is something which I, I've started to do with some vendors, and that's asking for reliability stats, and actually asking for code updates. How often are they released and why? My personal opinion at the moment, and certainly within the storage industry, and actually across the IT industry, code quality has got worse. We are seeing a lot more updates. We're seeing a lot more update, updates which aren't feature updates, they're fairly catastrophic bug updates. Somebody's had a really nasty bug. And it's not, I'd say, it's not case even a ver version .0 or something, you're gonna get rapidly go through those. So ask them and ask them for reasons why. Ask them awkward questions. How many of these bugs could have caused data loss? <coughs> not did they call da cause data loss, how many could have caused? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's it. I've kind of run out of time. So lots of sharks out there. It's also a thin, it's nice for a, there you go, the end. <laughs>